So now I wish you a very good evening and please bring all the colors from India and the smells. Good evening, brothers and sisters, farmers, and fellow practitioners. I'm really honored to be here because this is one of the only places anywhere in the world where farmers get together, practitioners get together, and I am truly very honored. So greetings from India. We say Namaskar. Namaskar, Namaskaram, you know, from depends on which part of India you're from, this is a classical greeting in India. Etymologically, it means that the sacred in me recognizes the sacred in you, and that I bow to your divine in you. I'm known as Bablu, as he said. Bablu means the little one, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> but my given name is Choitresh, uh, which means the Lord of Chaitra, or spring. And this is Manisha, as he said. Manisha Kairali, my daughter and co-worker. And... Uh, <laughs> Manisha, the daughter of Kerala, because my partner, my wife, is from Kerala, so she is the daughter of Kerala. But it also means it's, it's the name of a goddess, and it means the one with very sharp intellect, genius, in fact, and with a lot of sagacity. How many of you, maybe you should go and sit. I'll go over here. She'll, she'll talk a little later. <laughs> I wonder how many of you have been to India? Ah, quite a few, wow. <laughs> but it's a strange land. It's a strange and diverse land even for me. You know, we have so many people so much history, so many cultures, so many languages, so many religions, so many traditions, so many cuisines. Yet the length and breadth of this country has one commonality, and that is agriculture. An ancient system of cattle and ruminant-based agriculture with a strong relationship to the divine. And it has been practiced for more than 5,000 years in the thousands of villages of India. Unfortunately, the culture of agriculture has been changing in the last few decades with the introduction of large-scale industry and industrial agriculture some decades ago. In the process, our village economies have been shattered. And the villages have become mere suppliers of raw material uh, to the centers of industry. Millions of farmers, artisans, craftspeople, producers of food, arts, crafts, services have been displaced and unskilled. It is in this context that we at the Timbuktu Collective have been working to try and celebrate the rural, promote models of local and cottage industries that can rebuild the local and the village economies. 
So, do we get this lights on? Are we going to get these lights off? Okay. Whoops. Okay. Anyway, this doesn't tell you where we come from. We come from the south of India, almost in the center of the southern part of the Deccan Plateau of India. The slide seems to have gone missing. Uh, and it's a very dry area. This used to be, once upon a time, a very forested area, though it's a savanna grassland ecology. And it was famous for its forests, its animals, and for precious stones. It was 11% forest area in 1947 when we became independent. Today it's 0.5% forested. So you can see it's very dry. Oops, I am very bad at this. Okay. So, we don't need this. Can you see this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so in 1990, few of us got together and we bought a piece of land in this dry place, 32 acres of land. It was completely barren. I mean, it had some bushes and things like that. This photograph is, is from 1992. Basically, we bought it to create an agroforest habitat and to heal the land. <coughs> By 1995, we had started a small little school. We had settled down there, and slowly, the place started regenerating. And this is from 2010. From 21 species in 1990, it had grown to 400 species of flora. Usually, people give me a clap when they hear this. But the truth of the matter is that I didn't do anything. <laughs> we just protected that land. We just protected the land and let Mother Nature do her job. And believe me, she, has, she knows how to look after herself. Just we think, you know, we need to look after her. Well, the story then of Timbuktu Collective, the organization that came out of this Timbuktu space. So in 1990, we registered a nonprofit, and then in 91, we started working in Timbuktu. In 92, we started working in, in some villages around Timbuktu. And today, we are working in 175 villages with approximately 23,000 families, and we have helped organize many producer cooperatives. So basically our intervention in that area has been our work with women, which is our fla flagship program in alternative banking and getting women into the financial system, and I'll tell you more about that. We work with children on child rights, work in creating a community-managed bio-reserve, work with disability on organic farming and sustainable farming, and finally, creating producer-owned business enterprises. So today, I'm not going to talk about the other part of my work. I'm going to only talk about the work that is related to the local economy, regenerating the local economy. The first part of this whole presentation is going to be about this community-managed uh, uh, bioreserve. So you see there, that is a tank. We call it a tank. In India, in, especially in this area, 
we have some of the finest rainwater harvesting structures anywhere in the world. They are anywhere up to 1,000 acres in size. Do you know acres? You know hectares, right? So divided by 2.5 or something like that. <laughs> About 400 hectares in size. This this acre, this uh, tank is about 425 acres in size, and it has an eye cut. That means it waters about 600 acres of land. No electricity, no power, just through gravity. Now, this whole place is its watershed, and in that we took this area, which is about 7,500 acres of land. With the partnership of nine, 10 villages, we started protecting that place. And slowly, you'll see this is a photograph from 95, 96. You'll see that small little hut there, which is a watcher's hut. And you can see this. It's a grassland ecology with a few trees here and there. And this is the transformation that took place there. <laughs> Again, nothing to do with me. And then this is another photograph from 2016. Now, why is it that this is so important to the economy of that place? More than 60,000 sheep and goat go there to graze. More than 6,000 head of cattle go there to graze. All this is the watershed to two massive tanks, which does irrigation for hundreds of acres of land. So if this is not protected, there are seven rainwater harvesting structures that go as cascading after that tank, and they will all get silted up, which they are. They are quite spoiled till this time we did this. But over and above that, hundreds of birds have come back there. We have the gray wolf in all of India. We have about 5,400 uh, gray wolves remaining. In our area, there are only 555 gray wolves. And now this gray wolf has started denning there, which is a very good thing. It shows that life is coming back into that area. We have the black buck that has come back there, and of course, many, many more animals. I won't go into the whole thing. So coming back to this thing, this tank is the first tank among seven cascading tanks, and after which the water flows into the river. So we've been working, we worked on this tank, and you can see this photograph uh, was taken in 1998. There's about 10 feet of silt because all this area has gotten deforested. So all the soil from that has run in and silted up this uh, tank. So that earlier where we used to get three crops from this tank, now we're getting less than one crop. So we started desilting this tank, and this then became an example for the government, and then they started desilting the tanks. So this is a bird's eye view of that tank. This is the village. It's a, it's a very typical permaculture design. You have the, supposedly the forests here, the water here, the village here, and this is the agricultural land. Huge, 600 acres of that. Okay. Now, this is the most important work. This is the flagship program. And this is where we started learning that we need to revive the economy of, of the villages. And this is our work with women. It started off very small. Actually, uh, in 1992, we started with only women from 10 villages. And then slowly, in 1998, we registered the first cooperative in 99, we registered the second, and then the third, 
and then the fourth in 2011, and finally it's been federated into a larger organization of four cooperatives. So there are about 22,000, 23,000 members and uh, from 175 villages. They have a total capital base of 241 million rupees, which in dollars is about 3.52 million rupees, which is their money. It's money that they have saved. This is not microcredit. Many of you may have heard of microcredit. This is not microcredit. This is all their money that they saved 10 rupees a month. And they have created this capital base with which they give each other loans. And they give huge amounts of loans to each other. They have a very good community participation. They have savings of 1 uh, 197 million rupees. And they are completely financially independent. The fourth one was supposed to become financially independent by March 2019, but it has already become financially independent. So all the four cooperatives are run by the women, uh, used by the women, it's completely independent. So, but mind you that these cooperatives are not engaging with the market. They are engaging with the members, and then the members have started many thousands of small enterprises which engages with the market directly. Well, we said we need to build people's organizations that start engaging with the market, and they must engage with the market from a position of strength. So we said, let's try a farmer's cooperative. And we tried the farmer's cooperative only because the women's cooperative said, you know, the farmer, farmers are really struggling, the prices are not going up, suicides, we had huge amount of suicides, farmer suicides happening, and so they said, let's do something about it, and they put in the capital. The first capital was put in by the women's cooperative. Dharni is also a member of IFOM Organics International. So this is, 2,080 farmers, smallholder farmers, they're all five acres to 10 acres in size, small farmers in our area who are members of this cooperative. We basically grow millets, peanuts, and pulses on about 10,000 acres, and it's all organic. It's 100% organic. They have three processing units, where they process all the food, package it, and then sell it outside. So these are all some photographs of hand processing because we insist on not using high technology, but using human labor because it gives employment to the local population and also cleans much better than the machines do. So the total paid up share capital of the farmers themselves is about 7.7 .7 million Indian rupees. And they have assets worth about 25 million rupees. So this, what you see here, is hand processing. It's grinding with the hand, with stone, like it has been done for the last 5,000 years. And they say, and we think, and the people who buy this say, this tastes much better than the machine powdered one. But this is the most important part, and this is the USP of the whole cooperative, is that at least 50% of the revenue that it gets goes back to the farmers. And this in India has not been successful, I mean, nobody has been able to do this other than the milk cooperative, the big Amul milk cooperative that has managed to do it. So for every 100 rupees worth of product that is sold to the, to the consumer, at least 50 rupees must go back to the farmer. And that is the USP of this cooperative. These are some of the products, and they have, now they're selling it in about 251 stores all over South India. They make recipes, and so far, there's registered 4, uh, 45,000 eaters of this food. 
and the prices of these products are probably one of the lowest in, in India, in the organic. So that's the basic details. They, it's a farmer's own cooperative. Its uh, annual revenue is about 3.5 crores is what? What, 35 million? Half a million. Yeah. So the next thing that we did was we, we said if we are working with farmers, we have to work with the agricultural laborers who are even poorer than the farmers and who have to spend all their lives doing agricultural labor or labor that is generated by the government projects. So we said, why don't we start doing something about this? So we found these landless people. There are about 270 of them. And we said, what would you like to do? So they said, you know, these, these guys, they, they, they get these um, goats and sheep. Maybe we should get into the goat and sheep business. We said, fine, let's try it. So we organized some, some money. And they took this as a, as a, as a loan. And they started buying small sheep and goat and rearing them for a few months and then selling it into the market. Now, this has become big. So now there are, you know, it was formally registered as a cooperative in, in 2010. They have about 1,000 members from 53 villages. And they are buying and selling about 50,000 sheep and goat every year. And they are one of the richer cooperatives that we have. They, in fact, give loans to the farmers cooperative. And uh, they have been providing loans to themselves. So again, they were, they were not relating to the cooperative, uh, to the market as a cooperative. So only last year, they then decided that it's time that they start selling mutton, fresh mutton. And so they have started, and this is one of their advertisements, and they're doing pretty well, I must say. Well, Molly, now you better come. So, so what happened was we realized that the women are saving so much money, <coughs> and all the money is being retained in that place, which is very good. But then we started seeing, what are they buying? And from that, two enterprises came about. And Molly will tell you about that. This one is the This is back. This is fun. We'll switch it on. Yeah, this will work. This is on. Just speak. Hello. Speak. Hello. Yeah. Is it clear? All is clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All is clear. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Molly. Manisha is too formal. Uh, I'm going to be talking about two of the newer enterprises. So all that you've heard so far is over 25 years of work. Bhavani Cheneta Sangam. <coughs> Bhavani is one of the words for the divine uh, female power, creative energy. And this group is marketing its products under the name Timbuktu Weaves. This is just a picture to show you uh, how hand spinning of cotton is done. I just wanted to point this out because those of you, I mean, you might know one of the reasons the British colonized India is cotton. And it really clamped down hard on hand loom cotton in India. So hand spinning and hand weaving, or the hand loom, is what Mahatma Gandhi used to call the freedom fabric. Yeah, I'm wearing it. <laughs> I just wanted to show you the sari that I'm wearing. What I'm wearing is hand spun, hand woven, and naturally dyed. The Timbuktu Collective started a small program in 2007 for young women. So here, we are talking about women who don't fit into the farming category, who are high school dropouts, disabled, widows, or they've had two girl children, so the husband has abandoned them. 
Yeah, so we're talking about a very vulnerable section of young women who need, who basically needed a safe space to work. So the Timbuktu Collective started a small training program in natural dyes and handloom weaving. 2015, we started as an independent business of some of the young women who stayed over the years and were completely trained. I just wanted to point out here that none of them belong to weaving families. So I just also had something to say to the Dutch students earlier in the evening when they came and uh, had a lot of questions on their mind. If these young girls can make a living for themselves, and I'm talking about this, the previous speaker as well who spoke about $2, $3 a day. If they can make a living for themselves, completely illiterate, and coming from you know, non-artisan backgrounds in rural India, you have a lot of work you can do very easily. So being illiterate, not knowing how to do finances, not knowing how to write a bill, not knowing how to write their own name, we are still working with them, with all their systems, finances, accounting, processes. We are hand-holding them still, but they are now in a position where they pay themselves every month from the sales that they do of their fabric. Um, there's about 27 products. Uh, that the Weaving Center makes, right from simple things like handkerchiefs to towels to fabric to, to stitch yourself something to saris, dupattas, etc. The person you see in the center here, I'm going on talking about young women, and there's a man here all of a sudden. This is a very special person. He's the master weaver or trainer. And I wanted to actually put, talk, to, talk to you about him because um, in our part of India, weaving belongs with an upper caste. So we have the caste system in India. You have the lower caste and the upper castes. So the weaving in our areas, the, the knowledge, the technical know-how is held by the upper caste. So when we started a training program for young women from the lower caste, there was only one person who came forward to say, I don't care that they're women and I don't care that they're lower caste. I am willing to teach if they are willing to learn. And that's very special for the place we come from. <laughs> so that's what we believe. That's just a product uh, basket of our fabric, all naturally dyed. I'll be going into more detail uh, of the process of all this in the workshops in the coming few days, how we do our natural dyes, etc. But I, that's just, um, I wanted to show you that we do actually celebrate rural ingenuity. It's not a new uh, innovation that we're bringing in. Weaving always existed. It's just been on its way out. It's being forgotten. Natural dyes always existed. Um, the basket that you see, the technical know-how for that has always existed. We are just being the catalyst to bring that back. This is another smaller initiative. It's called Milita Jeevano Padula Sangam. <clears throat> Milita literally means inclusion. So uh, a large chunk of our work is with people with disabilities. Uh, they do a lot of rights and advocacy work for people with disabilities, and they also have a thrift and savings program. And a few years ago, they said it's all well and good. We can lobby the government, we can get our medical aid, we can get our uh, bus passes, our, our scholarships, etc. But we also want to be engaged in livelihood, the dignity of labor, of producing something, engaging with the market. Yeah? So a lot of thoughts about what we could do. We thought of free-range chicken, not feasible. We thought of dairy, also not feasible. Candle making and soap making. And somehow, soap making made sense. Um, all the members of this group are also directors of the disability program, which has about 1,040 members. So these 10 people are the directors of that group. So you see, it's important because they are leading about 1,000 people, all people with disabilities. And now they are engaged in handmade soap making. 
um, again, about 27 different products and very simple, basic stuff. We are not going into the very niche handmade soap market. We're making simple, good soap, simple, good uh, dishwash, floor cleaner, laundry soap, laundry bars, shampoo bars, things that the average person in our area needs. It's a requirement. All the ingredients that we use in this are all found locally as well. We use six different oils. So you see what's important here is that we're also supporting the local economy of the people who make those oils. Pongemia oil, neem oil, castor, sesame. So we're not going into the market and buying a refined oil. We're supporting the local tradespeople who are still making these oils. I don't know if any of you heard of soap nut, soap berry, anyone, yeah? So soap nut is available locally in our hills. So is neem, so is aloe vera, we grow all these things. Um, every time we make a batch of soap, we don't waste that water when we wash the dishes. We again use that to grow more aloe vera and we grow, use it to grow more uh, tulsi, holy basil, neem, uh, we also grow hibiscus, etc. So here you see a range of some of the soaps we've made and also simple products like infused hair oil and dishwash, etc. The runoff, the grey water runoff of these products is also perfectly safe because we don't use any harmful additives. We strongly believe in all producers meeting the buyers. So every time we do have an exhibition, we have the weavers there selling to the consumer. So you hear everything that the consumer has to say. If they have a compliment about how beautiful the indigo sari looks, the weaver needs to hear that. If somebody says, I absolutely love this soap, it's fantastic on my skin, the person who's made the soap needs to hear that. The last thing, which is just about 10 months old now, is a little shop called the Timbuktu shop on the highway in the village. And there was a lot of confusion when we were starting off saying, why would you have the shop in the village? You should be in the city. You should be in Bangalore. You should be in some big metro city so that you know you can, you know, you can, it's a bit more glamorous. <laughs> the first speaker today from Zimbabwe, I was fascinated by what she said because it struck a chord with what we do, which is to create a sense of pride in the rural and the local. Why does the village not deserve an organic shop? So this we started 10 months ago, and we are doing extremely well, extremely well. And 80% of our customers are rural people and are the people from the villages and towns around. That's it. I was, <clears throat> I was warned at least five times today that uh, see that you don't take up too much time <laughs> because we Indians are known to have a Indian, stretchable time. Indian stretchable time. It's okay. It's okay. But I think we've finished ahead of time. Yeah, <laughs> to tell because I have this time one of my friends said why don't you sing because I like to sing <laughs> but I thought I must say this story I must tell you this story and uh, this I remembered after I heard Miriam is it Miriam Marian Mariana speak and and I thought you know earlier I used to tell this story a lot in recent past, I've not been saying it that much. So I thought I must say it because I have some time. <laughs> so there is a whole room full of, you know, it's Sunday afternoon, and there's a whole group of astrophysicists 
not astrophysicists, what aeronautic engineers, aeronautical engineers sitting and drinking beer. Beautiful room, French windows, you can look outside, lovely garden. One of the French windows is open and in zooms a bumblebee. You know bumblebee? You know, it flies in a funny way and goes, bangs on the wall, falls down, gets up again, flies, yeah? <laughs> so these guys are drinking beer and they look at it and say, oh, wow. One of them walks up to the bee and says, madam, madam, if you don't mind, can we do a little study? She said, what study? No, no, we just want to see, you know, how you fly. She said, come on, I've got so much work to do. My kids are at home. I have to go and go take the nectar out, etc., etc. I don't have the time for all this. Madam, madam, please, this is of national importance. You know, we want to understand how you fly. So she said, well, these guys look like a little important people, you know, scientists and all that. Uh, she says, okay, one hour. That's all the time I can spend. So they say, okay, and out comes the ruler, the scale, you know, the protractor, and they do the measurement of the wings and then the stomach and the legs and feed it into the computer. Da, 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 da. It goes to the satellite, comes back into the printer, zat, 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 zat. and then they start discussing and talking and again doing, one hour is gone. She says, hey, listen, I've got to go. Madam, don't you understand? This is of very important scientific, why don't you understand? You women just don't understand things. So she said, oh, must be something really important. So she sits down and again they start measuring and they talk, you know how these intellectuals are. That blah, 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 a lot, lot of talking. And uh, by then it's about four in the evening and she says, enough. And she puts her foot down and she says, enough gentlemen, I have to go, my kids are waiting. The shops will close, I have to do my business. So they look at her and they say, okay, you may go. Anyways, you wasted our whole day. She said, what? You wasted my day? Please explain to me what you found out. They say, look, you won't understand, woman. You won't understand. You don't understand what is trigonometry, blah, blah, blah. So she said, try me. <laughs> So they took it out and they started reading from it and they said, look, the fact of the matter is you can't fly. <laughs> she said, what? No, yeah, I, we told you you won't understand. Your stomach's too big, your wings are too thin, your legs are too thin. You can't fly. She said, what's wrong with you guys? I can fly, my kids can fly, my parents could fly, my grandparents could fly. We all fly. They said, see, we told you, you won't understand. <laughs> so she said, okay, forget it. And so she started to fly. And she couldn't fly. That's the end of the story. <laughs> you know, you know, that's the problem with people like us who are from colonized countries. We've been told that we are worth nothing. You know, our philosophy does not matter. We don't know anything about realism. We don't know anything about, you know, soul, spirit. We are stupid. We don't even know how to live our lives and we have to be told by everybody how to live our lives. Right from agriculture to industry. We just don't know anything. And we've come to believe it. And the, the bourgeois in our country make us believe that also. So we have to break out. We have to begin flying, just like in Africa. In India, we have started flying. I hope we will fly. 
but we want our village people to fly. <laughs> in the cities, they have started flying. But in the village, we want them to fly, and that's what we are trying to do, to fly along with them. Thank you. Thank you.